I'm Kendra. I'm an addict. Um, so I'm so excited that we have our speaker with us tonight. Um, she came in the rooms a little bit after me, but um, in the time that I have been a part of CA, I've seen this woman um, really exemplify what it means to like work a program. She works the steps. <laughs> She sponsors people. She goes to meetings like she does everything. And it's not just, she's not just doing it for show. Like she truly like does the damn thing. So um, it is, <laughs> it is with the, my great pleasure that I am introducing Jesse from Nashville. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Um, <laughs> I'm not very good with compliments still, so super uncomfortable. Um, my name's Jesse. I'm definitely a drug addict and an alcoholic. Hi. Um, cool. So my sober date is December 27th, 2016. That's wild. That's a that's yeah it doesn't seem like it's that long ago because I still remember being so desperate and wanting to die, not wanting to die, but not wanting to live. Um, I do have a sponsor. She's got like 30 years. Um, I meet with her regularly. I go to meetings at least three, four times a week. Last week I didn't, but that's okay. Um, yeah, so I grew up in New York. Um, God, I'm nervous, sorry. Um, so growing up in New York, what that looked like for me, um, I played a lot of basketball. I was very involved in my community. Um, I was raised Catholic. Being raised Catholic for me was actually a good experience. I think I'm like the only one. <laughs> um, but yeah, God was a big part of my life. Um, family and community, big part of my life. I do remember being young and like both sides of my family are riddled with alcoholism, drug addiction, mental illness. So for me, I do think I came by this kind of genetically almost. Not in the book, but that's my opinion for myself. Um, my mom, I think she's coming up on 50 years sober. Yeah, long time for Mama Dukes. Um, so I grew up in a dry house, like she didn't use drugs or alcohol, but with that being said, she struggled really bad with mental illness, um, bipolar, with mania, um, hallucinations at times. So it wasn't super safe. Um, I didn't really know like what mom I would be coming home to when I left school. I'd get woken up at three in the morning to like clean ceilings, um, <laughs> <It's> a, <laughs> if you know about mania, it is a cleaning thing. Um, or my mom would sleep for like weeks at a time and I would have to like cook at five. And so I kind of had to grow up fast. It could have been a lot worse. And now that I'm sober and have worked the steps, like my mom did the best she could with what she was given. Um, and like... I thank her so much for who she is today and the relationship we have today. It wasn't like that while I was drinking and doing drugs. But um, my dad was not a big part of my life. Um, I was told at a young age that I reminded him too much of my mother, so he didn't know like what to do with me. Basically, my dad hated me, so um, he would give my sister gifts on her birthday intentionally forget mine or call me on the wrong day um and again he did the best he could with what he was given there's a lot of forgiveness that has come along with recovery um but yeah that was kind of my childhood I did have a stepdad who was like the best person in the world um he just he was my dad person he raised me he protected me a lot from my mother and like from kind of her insanity. Um, my mom and stepdad, they divorced. And then in true alcoholic fashion, my mom decided to remarry him. Um, <laughs> it, I don't know. She's like Liz Taylor. She's got 100 ex-husbands. Um, 
So we decided, well, she decided that we were going to move from New York right outside Manhattan um, to Fort Myers, Florida. Oh, my God. Fort Myers now is beautiful, but it's like God's waiting room. Like, it is old people, and New York was just like, it was literally, I felt like I moved to a different planet. Um, I had, like, fire engine red hair and wore like baggy jeans and my accent was different and I moved to this place in Florida that's by the beach and all the girls are like blonde and blue eyed and I just did not fit in at all and I had a really thick New York accent um so I felt really out of place very quickly um I was 13 when we moved so it was hard. Um, I knew that like I needed to fit in to feel better about myself. So I dyed my hair brown. I stopped saying coffee and dog and walk. And I started saying y'all and got a bathing suit. And like I stopped playing basketball. I didn't go to church anymore. I just, I needed to feel okay. Um, and even when I was younger and like a kid, I like I remember the way that I felt dictated everything and everyone around me. Like if I was happy, I was well behaved. I listened to my mom. I did good in school. If I was angry or upset, I raised hell. The house was not good. So like my feelings really dictated my life. Um, and that played a played a huge part in my drug abuse and alcoholism um so yeah I'm down in Florida changed my entire who I am or who I think I am um and I fit in and I clicked up with some people that I thought were super cool and they had money and nice cars and all the things that I thought that I wanted um I went to high school and that's kind of when drinking got introduced to me again I grew up in a sober home so like I didn't have access to drugs and alcohol at a younger age I probably would have if I did um but I remember we a girlfriend of mine I think we were like 14 or 15 I'm about to show my age but she got strawberry Boone's farm <laughs> hey Mason you know um for all you young ones, it's like a strawberry wine um, and, <laughs> and strawberry wine. And we went to like the movie theater, which was like a mall, and we drank and walked around and it was cool. It was the cool thing to do. I didn't automatically, for me, I didn't become an alcoholic after my first drink. Um, I knew that I liked it. I thought it tasted good. Um, so after that experience, I kind of, um, I was like full grown at 14. So I got a fake ID very early, which made me feel important and special because like I was buying kegs for the keg parties and like liquor from the liquor store for the older kids. And, um, I started kind of just partying on the weekends. It didn't, again, like I didn't take my first drink and I was like, ooh, alcoholism, ooh, drug addiction. But I did notice that I could drink more than the girls around me for sure. Um, you know, they would have their three like Smirnoff ices and be falling over. And I'm like hanging out with the fucking 300 pound football players pounding beer like, what's up? Um, so I kind of noticed that I might be a little bit different, but did not care. Um, we were at a party, a house party, one weekend, and decided we were drinking. Um, we went to the beach, then went to a pool party, and then we were going to another party after that. I was almost 16 at this time. Um, and in Fort Myers, there's this one road, and it's residential, so you're supposed to go 30 miles an hour, but there are palm trees lined up on both sides of it, and it's north and south um, with palm trees. 
So my best friend at the time, Ashley, she was driving. I was in the passenger seat. We had two boys with us. Um, and we turned to find this kid's house. And uh, we were all drinking. And we drove right past the house with all the cars. Couldn't find the party because we were drunk. Turned back around. Um, and like, in I don't know, when I grew up and growing up, wearing your seatbelt, being caught with your seatbelt on was like social suicide. You do not wear your seatbelt under any circumstances. You lean your seat back as far as you can. Windows down, blunt smoking, just that's, you do not wear seatbelts. Ugh, so stupid. Um, so I didn't have my seatbelt on. And still clear as day, I know, like, I can say this today and not think that it's like a hallucination. We came to the stop sign and I heard clear as day, in my head, a voice say, put your seatbelt on. So I clicked my seatbelt on, and we went to turn south, and we ended up turning in the northbound lane, and we collided with another kid that went to our school. Um, I don't really remember. I just woke up, like, by the sidewalk. Like, there's that patch of grass in between the sidewalk and the road, a ditch. I don't know what you want to call it. But I remember I woke up, and... I saw like lights and noise, heard, I didn't see noise, I might have, but like, I knew that I was out of it and something really bad had just happened. Um, this, <laughs> I do remember this part though, this, the most handsome EMT man, it was like Baywatch, he was like running towards me and I was like, this is cool. Um, He's like, were you in the accident? And I'm like, no. I didn't want to get in trouble. Like, I did not want to get in trouble. I thought my mom was going to beat my ass. Like, I was very scared. And I didn't know what happened. Um, so I totally was in the accident. And um, my best friend uh, passed away instantly. Um, she did not have her seatbelt on. One of the boys in the back um, had to relearn how to walk. Um, the other one shattered his leg, lost, like, a scholarship to a D1 school. Um, and all I had was just a small little nick on my knee. So, basically, I walked away. Totally fine. Physically. Mentally, not so much. Um, going back to high school after the accident, because that was the beginning of summer, I again felt like immediately on the outside because any hallway I walked down, it was like, oh my God, there's that girl. She was in the accident. Do you remember seeing her at the funeral? And I just like, I felt so uncomfortable and there was so much guilt and grief. And I was a kid. I was a teenager. Like I had no idea how to handle any of these things that just happened. Um, like, I had to tell my best friend's mom the last minutes of her life at 15. So it was really heavy. Um, so pretty much after the accident, I was like, it's CA. Um, fuck God. Uh, he can suck it. And we're just going to roll. And I kind of had, like, this invincibility complex. I'm like, well, I didn't die in a fatal car accident, so you can't kill me. So I started drinking a lot more heavily, um, but it was hard to get away with it with my mother because she's been sober for so long and she started like smelling it on me. So I needed to find another substance that I could take way more regularly that I wouldn't get caught. Um, so I, I don't even know like how it got offered or what happened, but I instantly fell in love with Xanax like hell yeah oh my god Ugh. I'm a benzo girl <laughs> um that's that's my drug of choice um opiates too and cocaine pretty I'm a dumpster fire um but the minute I took my first Xanax I was like this is it forever Forever and ever, I, it was my first love. I, 
I never felt so good and so at peace and so settled in my entire existence on the planet. Um, so yeah, after my first one, I was, I was, it was on, like I had to have that all the time. Um, and I drank a lot on top of it. So I became known as like the blackout queen. Yeah. I blacked out for like 15 years of my life. <laughs> like just gone completely. Um, and to me, all these things were still normal. Like I graduated high school. I went to college at 17. I still got decent grades. Um, college did not last because I drank the whole time and blacked out and caught some charges. So I had to go back home. Um, but I figured out I was really good at kind of like talking to people and I like drinking. So I became a bartender. <laughs> Yay. Might as well make money and get fucked up. Um, so yeah, I did that. And then um, I had my first charges and then I caught charges while on probation. So I violated. Um, and in my head, I didn't think that I would like, I thought I would bond out like super quick. Let's go. They already had the title to my car. Like my bondsman knew me at this point. That didn't happen. Um, so I went to jail beginning of January, um, 2005 and I was detoxing in jail and that, oh my God, it sucked so bad. It was so fucking horrible. Um, but I remember after being done detoxing, I was I, about a month later, I still didn't feel right. Like I didn't feel good. I was still throwing up. My body hurt. Um, and I told one of the CEOs, so they gave me a pregnancy test at 20 and I was pregnant. I found out that I was pregnant in jail. <laughs> I was terrified, absolutely terrified. Um, you know, and then I come here all these years later, and I remember hearing, um, God's going to do for you what you can't do for yourself. And I was like, that's the grossest thing I've ever heard. Y'all are so stupid. Nope. Um, and it's 100% true. Absolutely, factually true in my life. Um, God plucked me up and put me in a jail cell for three months so that I could sober up and have a healthy pregnancy. Um, I got out after about three months, and I was sober for the rest of my pregnancy. Hold on. I turned 21. That's a lie. I turned 21, and I had, like, two glasses of wine, and I just cried the whole time because I was like, I'm killing my baby. Um, he's fine. Um, <laughs> he's totally fine. I don't suggest doing that, but the kid's fine. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I was able to be sober. Now, I still crave drugs. I still wanted to drink every second of the day. I thought about it all the time. It was still an obsession. I just didn't because I was pregnant. Um, so I had my son, and he was perfectly healthy. Um, I went back to bartending pretty quickly because... We don't get PTO. Uh, <laughs> you got to go to work to make money. Um, and I stayed sober for a little bit. And then it just all started to come down again. Um, you know, I worked in really like high end clubs. So the Coke dealer was another bartender, um, which was great. Um, it, was, it was awesome. Um, so yeah, like we had our ritual. We would go into work. The girls would go do their makeup and get ready. We would take a couple shots, do a whole bag of cocaine guys stash. And then I'd work until four in the morning um, and drink and do more coke and drink and then take Xanax to come down. And then I came down too much. So I'd do more coke. Like it was never, I could never find that balance. Um, and that was my life for years, years and years and years, just on repeat all the time. Um, and swinging back to my mother, like, thank God for her, because I would drop my son off at like eight o'clock at night and then go to work. And half the time I'd still be 
fucked up picking him up in the morning at seven o'clock in the morning from her. Um, yeah, not good. So yeah, that was my life. It was from the moment my eyes opened until the moment they closed. Drugs. That's all I could think about. Um, rationing things out to make sure that I still had some in the morning so that I wouldn't be sick. Um, I tried. I didn't try to stop. I ran out, let's be honest. <laughs> I didn't try to stop. Um, I had a seizure outside of a Waffle House once. I didn't have anything, <laughs> and it was sucked. Um, very out-of-body experience, like hovering above the Waffle House. It was just so weird. Um, just so strange, seizures. Um, but, I mean, I was getting to the point, like, if I couldn't get benzos, I mean, Roxy's, Oxy's, Percocet, anything that I could get my hands on, I was in. Um, Tramdol, it took like a whole bottle once to try to get fucked up. It didn't work. I felt real sick. I was so sick. It was not good. Ugh. Um, heart meds, tried those once. Didn't, it didn't do anything. <laughs> like that's the kind of, that's just what I did. And anyone that was around me, like they knew that I had a problem, but like I just thought I was the life of the party. I was not. Um, I was stealing, I was lying, I was driving my kid drunk in my car, I was forgetting to pick him up, I was wildly unpredictable, um, I would show up to football games wasted, um, yeah, it was not, it was not pretty, um, I just didn't know any other way, that's just what my life was, I accepted it at that point, it was whatever, like, I'm just going to get as fucked up as humanly possible all the time. Um, pretty much down in Florida, like, it's pretty, it's kind of the same in, in anywhere in the hospitality industry. Like, once you get a bad name, you're done. Like, I had been fired <laughs> from everywhere. Um, and it was either for being drunk, wasted, blackout drunk behind the bar, um, stealing, of course, um, not showing up, showing up drunk. So I got like blacklisted in Florida. So I couldn't work. Like nobody would hire me with good reason. Back then I thought that it was their problem. They were wrong. How dare they? Uh, no, I was a horrible employee and should not have been hired by anyone. Um, and my mom started to like get more involved with my alcoholism and drug addiction like she could see how bad it was getting so she was kind of threatening to take Ryan my son by the way I'm living with her at this point um which was so not fun oh god it was awful um so yeah I was like I'm out I'm gonna move to Nashville I don't know anybody nobody knows me I can start over I can be whoever I want to be my son's father had lived up here um so I was like down. I'm like, I'm out. Um, <laughs> I had gotten off probation for like, I don't know, the eighth time at that point. And the next day after I'd gotten off probation, we packed a moving truck and we were up here in Nashville. Um, and in my heart, like I really did think things would be different. But the first thing I did when we like unpacked the truck, I went to the store and I got shit-faced, absolutely wasted, just gone. Um, yeah, so I did that up here. I just, anywhere I went, my problems went with me. And I, I didn't want it to be that way. I just, it just, there I was, there I was. Um, and up here in Nashville, it was a little bit harder for me to like get drugs because I didn't know anybody. Um, but that changed very quickly as a bartender because it's like you're at the party. Um, but yeah, I just worked and took care of my kid to the best of my ability. I'm very fortunate that Ryan was never like taken from me. He should have been like he really should have been, but he wasn't. Um, again, my mom kind of knew how bad it was getting and especially being in Nashville where I didn't know, any know anybody and nobody knew me. No family other than my son's father. Um, my mom decided to move to Nashville too, 
which thank God she did because she helped save my life. Um, what time is it? So yeah, I don't even know really what happened that day, except it was a normal Tuesday or Wednesday for me. I was, I went to bed drunk, got up drunk, took my kid to school, drunk, dropped him off, stopped by the Exxon by my house, got a 24 pack of PBR. It was so gross. <laughs> hey, it was just the cheapest shit I could get, okay? Um, and I had my white wine and my fireball that was that's how bad it was um and I had already snorted like two full bars so I was ready for the day we um and I went home at 7 30 in the morning and I started drinking um I remember that week I kind of was like idealizing suicide um but I I didn't want my son to find me I didn't want my dog to be alone I know it's horrible um so I was kind of like trying to figure out a way in my head of like, how do I make it look like an accident? Um, and that was, that was like really in the front part of my brain that whole week. So it's like that Tuesday and I'm drunk as shit, sitting on my floor, contemplating suicide. And the next thing I know, my phone's in my hand and I hear my mom and I'm like, did I just call my mother this blacked out? This is so bad. And out of nowhere, out of my mouth just came the words, I need help. I need help now, right now. And she was like, on my way. What do you need? I was like, food. And she was like, cool. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, hadn't eaten ever. So like, I don't know. Um, in Florida, we didn't have Zaxby's at that time. So I had never had Zaxby's before. Um, so my mom comes over with like a whole thing of chicken tenders and I'm on the floor literally like snotting and crying into Zaxby's sauce, just like eating my own tears. And my mom's just like looking at me, totally non-judgmental, like, let's go. What do you need? And I'm like, I'm going to kill myself, point blank period, if I don't get help. And she was like, all right. So we looked at rehabs. Um, and my mom is like big on Dr. Phil. I don't know. That's like her thing. Um, so she was like, ooh, Dr. Phil says the ranch or Cumberland Heights. And I was like, mom, I don't give a shit. I just don't want to die. Like, I'm going to kill myself. I don't care. Um, so the day after Christmas, I went to Cumberland Heights. Yep, love that place. Um, and I remember the drive out there. I was like popping pills like they were Tic Tacs, just like all of them. Um, and I remember, honest to God, thinking that I was just going for a drinking problem. And I remember in admissions, this is the only thing I remember because I was blacked out, um, telling them that I had to have Xanax every four hours for, <laughs> for my anxiety. <laughs> oh, my God. And, like, I really believed that. I was like, I have to have this medication every four hours. And this lady's like, okay, <laughs> fuck, you're coming to rehab. And I'm like, well, I haven't drank in 24 hours. Um, they didn't give me any more, <laughs> just in case. Uh, if anybody, no, they, they didn't taper me off. It just was what it was. Um, but, yeah, I... I don't know, I was at Cumberland Heights and I just listened and I just did, I, it was life or death at that point. I just did what they told me to do, which was the first time in my entire life that I just did what somebody else told me. Because again, one, I'm selfish and I think that I know everything. And two, my feelings dictate my life. And I felt shitty for like a year after getting sober, sorry. But that's the reality for me. Um, but yeah, I went to Cumberland Heights for two weeks and I got out and I went right to a meeting. Um, not that day, the next day. I remember I went to a meeting and I, f I thought the meeting started at like 8 o'clock. So I was like, cool, 7.50, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get my star. I'm early. No, they were doing the prayer at the end. And I walked in and I was absolutely terrified. And this wonderful, beautiful older man who looked exactly like my grandfather, who I adored my grandfather, 
broke the prayer circle, came up to me, grabbed my hand, and was like, hi, you're going to come back here on Wednesday at 8 o'clock, and I'm expecting to see you. Dude, That just that one act of kindness changed my entire perspective on meetings and, like, how I should be at meetings. Um, and I went back. I didn't get a sponsor right away. I don't recommend that, um, <laughs> like, at all. I just... I thought if I got a sponsor that I would like drink the Kool-Aid and then I would have to like meet this bitch and like do stuff and I didn't want to do any of that shit. I just was like, I don't know. At about six, seven months, I was in so much pain emotionally that I just needed to do something or I was going to go back out again. So I got a sponsor and we worked steps one through five together. And I still had a really, really poor relationship with God when I came in. God was my number one resentment besides myself. It was me and God. Um, God made me this way. God did all these horrible things to me. God God was just not my dude. I hated God. Um, And I'm so grateful that I chose the sponsor that I did because she had such a good relationship with the God of her understanding. Um, And she really walked me through steps like one through three um and now having like seven and something years sober like step one what that looks like for me today is drugs and alcohol are gonna kill me period that's it two do I think that there's something bigger than me that can help me yeah step three do I want to live or do I want to die if I want to die I could stop right there that's cool no I'll choose to live Step four, should I write some shit down that God already knows about and that I already know about that I already did? Yeah. Um, You know, step five, am I willing to, like, sit down with another woman and be 100% honest and let God listen? Yeah, might as well. Got nothing else to do. Um, At that point, I didn't. Um, You know, step six and seven, what they look like for me is just asking for God's help. Like, God is my dude now. It's the birds. um, It's songs. It's people. It's interactions that I have with others. It was driving over here. Not like, y'all, I don't come out to Lebanon or wherever we are. I don't even know where we are. (laughs) I know I'm physically here, but I don't know where we are. Um, And I saw, like, a full-blown rainbow full-blown rainbow and I'm like dude that's God that's God like giving me a little like hey you're doing the right thing go do your go be of service to others um which I thought was super cool so yeah my relationship with God today is really good um step six and seven is continuous because I'm a human being I make mistakes I'm not always peachy and fun I can be blunt a little bit rude sometimes Um, but I know that like my character defects can be worked on through God, my God. Um, getting to the amends part for me of the program was, I think when I really had like my full spiritual awakening, the rest of it, I was kind of just like going through the motions of like, fuck it. Y'all just tell me what to do. I don't care. (laughs) I just don't care. Um, Like, step four wasn't that big of a deal to me. I did not care. Um, So I just wrote. But, yeah, step uh, eight and nine for me were huge. Um, I was able – I got sober when my son was 11. Um, I was able to sit down with him and look at him in his beautiful brown eyes and make a real amends to him. Not tell him, I'm sorry. I won't do it again. No, like a true amends of, hey, I was really, really sick for a really, really long time. I was not the mother you deserved. I wasn't fully present. I wasn't good. Um, I explained it the best I could for an 11-year-old at that point. And I was able to look him with full sincerity and say, what can I do to make this right? And what do you need for me as your mother? What can I do? And, like, God, he's such a good kid. Um, When I told him how sick I was, he was like, 
Yeah, I know. I'm like, oh my God, fucker. <laughs> Jerk. I thought I was such a shifty one. I wasn't. Um, but yeah, my son's relationship and I now is amazing and beautiful. He just graduated high school. It's crazy. Um, he's going to a four-year college. He's going to Ole Miss. Unbelievable. Because, um, like, I was selling drugs and catching charges at 18, and he's like, I don't know if he's one of us. I know that there's a seat for him if he needs it. I know that he knows that there's a solution if he does have a drug problem or alcohol problem. Um, and it's really funny, too, to see this kid. Um, he uses the program without knowing he's using it. Like, he's a, he's a teenager, so he can be a dick, you know? He's just a kid. And he's my kid, so of course. But, like, he's able to look at me and say, hey, I was out of line. What can I do to make it right? What? Like, my kid says, what can I do to make it right? It's so cool. <laughs> And that's because of this program. That's not me. Like, what can I do to make it right? Nothing. I'm going to go do more drugs. Um, you know, steps 10, 11, and 12 for me are maintenance. I try my best to do a 10-step inventory. I slack sometimes. Um, steps 11, you know, that constant prayer and meditation. I read the daily reflections every day. I have a 30-minute drive to work, so I always talk to God. I try to read page 63 in the big book every day. It talks about like selfishness and self-centeredness. And now that we have a new employer, how can we best serve God? Because um, I need to be reminded that I'm selfish. Even without drugs and alcohol, I'm still selfish. I'm still a drug addict. Um, and then step 12, like sharing the message. I'm here in this microphone, hopefully not too loud. Um, <laughs> Never. Um, but this life is really beautiful. And I will say, you know, over the seven years that I've been sober, life has happened. Like big life shit for me has happened. Um, uh, in September 2021, we lost my sister to suicide. Um, yeah, that was horrifying. Absolutely horrifying. Um, but I can say that like I was sober when my mom called me and I've stayed sober. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know the right words. Like it's not a silver lining that I'm sober, but my mom called me at midnight. I was able to pick the phone up because I was sober. The first thing that I thought about, it wasn't, oh my God, I hope I have more drugs to numb this. It was how do I help my family? What can I do to be there for my mother? How do I help my son? Because this is his favorite person in the entire world. It wasn't me, me, me. It was how can I help my family? Um, and that wouldn't have been the case if I was using. And it was rough after that, not going to lie. I was holding on by the skin of my teeth. I don't even know. Um, I think I blacked out sober for a couple months. Um, but I did the same things then that I did when I first got sober. I went to meetings. I called my sponsor immediately, and I started the steps over. And again, God kind of randomly shows up. Like within that first month of losing my sister, I had five sponsees. And like, y'all, I wasn't raising my hand. I, wasn't, I didn't want to do any surface work whatsoever. I wanted to crawl in a hole. Um, but I had five sponsees, and all of them were like willing. They called me every day. They like wanted to meet up and I was like, shit, I actually like, damn it. Like, can one of y'all fall off? And they didn't, like they stuck with me. <laughs> um, but that kind of stuff kept me sober. Um, you know, my son had an opportunity to probably go division one in football and he had a horrible back injury right after losing my sister. So like two years were rough, so rough. I quit my job. Like, it just was like life after life after, after life. But I do, I know that, like, I wasn't the creator of the chaos. It just was life. It was just life. And 
because of the program and because of you guys and and the steps and CA and AA and all the A's, like I stayed sober through that really, really hard shit. Um, and now I live in Fairview. It's country. I don't even know how the hell I got out there. Um, in a beautiful house with a wonderful man. And my son, like I said, he's going to Ole Miss. How cool is that? Hotty toddy. Um, I have a job that, like, they like me, and I do a good job. I'm still a bartender, oddly enough. <laughs> some can, some can't. I can. Um, and I'm sober, and life is absolutely wonderful today. So, yeah. Um, I'm really grateful that I got to share my story with you guys. And if you're new, keep coming back. And that's all I got. Bye. Yeah.